Transportation is a huge topic. And um, I'm going to show you that I have a lot more slides than I can go through today. So some of them are going to be for your reference. So don't be surprised if I just kind of skip through a couple of them to get on to another topic. Um, it's a lot to try to cover in, in our single lecture. But what I'm hoping to do is introduce you to a lot of the topics and maybe think, help you think about transportation holistically and think about it in, in, in some different ways. To start with, with talking about uh, Carl Knapp. So Carl Knapp used to teach with us. Uh, he taught this class for, I believe, eight or nine years. Um, was teaching with me when I started teaching this class in 2015. He sadly has passed away from ALS, but he was a huge proponent of electrification of transportation as one of his things. He also is the origin of a lot of the costumes and, and t-shirts you'll see throughout the quarter for me. So this is a picture of Carl Knapp in an electric vehicle. Um, he had this imported uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, it was one of only like five that were imported to the US. And he could drive it right to class. So he would drive it between the poles and then move it, drive it on campus and bring it right up to lecture um, on class, in, in class. So just to give a sense of the electrification of transportation has really come a long ways since this was what electrified transportation looked like. Now we have, uh, I would say, electric cars that are even more advanced than our gasoline, their gasoline counterparts. Um, and for a long time, they were just kind of a sideline. They were for people that were passionate about this, but were willing to give up some of the features. And that's not what we're seeing in transportation today. I wanted to mention the GoEV program. So I have my GoEV shirt, the Carl Knapp GoEV program, um, which is with Actera. Actera is a local nonprofit that really works on a lot of energy and climate issues, uh, especially around low-income communities. So the GoEV program is really about workshopping with low-income communities to help those families understand what are the incentives, the, the subsidies, those things that are available to them if they want to have electric vehicles and to just help them through that process because it can usually be pretty complicated um, in terms of getting a lot of those benefits and get them into electric vehicles, get them talking to people that drive electric vehicles, help them understand what that, what that would look like. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of community work, they do a lot with food and climate. They do a lot of other things with low-income communities in the Bay Area. I recommend you check out Actera. Um, some of you, I think, got to go to the EV event at the Explore Energy House with Actera. So very active in our local area. So that's, that's part of my transportation wardrobe today. I also have a bicycle. This is, this is actually my grandmother's necklace, and she gave it to me. Um, so to, to think about by, like transportation, we're, we're going to talk a lot about cars. Personal transportation is a huge portion of our energy. But just to remember that, that that can mean a lot of different things. My favorite mode of transportation is walking. If I could walk everywhere and I had the time to do that, I would walk. I would love that. Um, but we don't have the time to do those kind of things. But thinking holistically, all of that is, is transportation. And so we'll talk about that. Um, just to give you a big picture summary of what we're going to talk about today. So what do we use transportation for? We use it to move ourselves around, and we use it to move our stuff around. Right? Those are the two big things that we're doing with transportation. Personal mobility and moving freight um, are things around. OK, so transportation is a big sector um, because of the energy use, the greenhouse gas emissions, the air pollution. Um, and in particular, the air pollution from transportation tends to be where people are. So if you think about air pollution plus exposure to population, it has a high impact on the health of people because that, that, that air pollution is right where people live and work. Transportation also tends to be pretty um, inefficient in a lot of different metrics, so both in like how we're moving the cars around, you know, it, using that, the energy in, in our oil or our gasoline very inefficiently to move the car around, how often we use our vehicles. So if you're thinking about the capital intensive, intensity to build that vehicle, and then how often is it parked versus actually being utilized. And then we have a huge infrastructure 
involved with our transportation system, which also is used pretty inefficiently if we're thinking about roads, parking lots, things like that. So there's a lot here that we could be, be doing better, and we're going to talk about some of the ways that we can improve the efficiency in these, these different areas. Social costs um, for gasoline and diesel often are not reflected in the price of gasoline and diesel. Um, and so we're going we're gonna to talk about that, the, the differences in taxes for, for gasoline and diesel. Um, we don't have a carbon price right, on our fuels. There's a lot of other social costs that society bears, those externalities like we talked about in our first lecture that aren't in the, the price of our gasoline and diesel fuel. All right, there's a lot of different things that impact the energy use of transportation. I think that's pretty obvious, and we'll go more into that. And I think the most exciting thing about transportation, which is why there's, there's so much here and, and it's hard to cover it all in one lecture, is that things are changing now. We have lots of different types of transportation, um, different services, so on-demand services that we didn't have in the past, and a lot of changing in the technology for transportation. And so it's a really exciting time to be looking at transportation because things were static and now they're not. So we have electrification, first mile, last mile innovation. So those are ways to get like to and from public transit. Um, so that can support our public transit systems. Shared mobility, you know, our lifts and our Ubers, so our on-demand transportation. Um, automation, which we've was a lot in the news, I think, recently with with crews now not uh, allowed to not have drivers in their autonomous vehicles um, because of some of the safety concerns. But automation is something that is more and more becoming part of our transportation system. And so lots are changing. And so it's, it's a really exciting time to see, see what's happening with transportation. All right, and then that first video really was talking about this. And we'll talk a little bit more about this. But transportation is really important um, and a lot of aspects for equity and justice and, and human development. And so access to equitable transportation options gives you access to better food. It can give you access to better jobs. Um, it can really impact quality of life. And so that is also really important. I'm going to start with some historical highlights. And so don't get overwhelmed by these. these uh, it's going to be a list of history. Uh, for a couple of slides, and I'm just going to highlight a few things, and you can go back and look at historical things that you find interesting. But I think the history is important, and this is a US-based history of, of transportation. And so if we're looking at some of the historical milestones in terms of US transportation, big one is the Model T, right? So heard of the Model T. This was Henry Ford figuring out how to mass produce vehicles to make them cost effective for the masses. And so we saw this dramatic increase in personal ownership of vehicles, not because of a technology advancement, but because of a manufacturing advancement. And being able to make the same part over and over again made it more economic to build personal vehicles. And so you can see in 1908, when this was introduced, we had 200,000 vehicles on the road. 40 years later, we have 31 million vehicles on the road. Dramatic increase in, in vehicles. OK, another important piece of history for the US in terms of transportation was in 1956. Um, this is President Eisenhower doing the Interstate Highway Act. So this was a government investment in the roadways in our country so that it would make it easier to move around our country by vehicle. The motivation for this from the, the federal government standpoint was to be able to move the military around our country. If we needed to move the military one place to another because the, you know, for security reasons, we needed good roads. And so this was a huge government investment in roadways in our country, which really led to the triumph of personal vehicles over other modes of transport, like, like trains, um, because it was so easy to get around with your personal vehicle. So it really took that government investment in our infrastructure to make that happen. The other thing I want to mention here is the CAFE standard. So that's corporate average fuel economy. This is the first time we had fuel economy standards on our vehicles. And we'll talk more about what that looks like. Again, this was prompted by that Arab oil embargo. 
So that one event has come up quite a bit in this class because it impacted a lot of the policies, not just in the US, but around the world. Um, so this was a major policy. We also saw, remember, we'll talk more about renewables. We'll talk about PURPA. It was a policy that came out of that oil embargo. It was this realization that oil prices and oil availability has huge impacts on our economy. And so how can we reduce our dependence on that, that single resource? And so fuel economy standards were put in place in the mid-70s for that. OK. We all see hybrids, but I'd just like to give this little history that hybrids really didn't start to be on the road until about 20, 25 years ago. Um, and in 2000 is when we started to see hybrid electric vehicles. And then the first time we had fuel economy standards for big rigs, like large trucks, wasn't until 2011. So although we had fuel economy standards for personal vehicles and personal trucks, it was much later that we had them for medium and heavy duty vehicles and then later for, for larger vehicles. And so there's, those policies are important to give all of the manufacturers the same requirements so that they prioritize the fuel economy of their vehicles. With a low cost, the relative cost of gasoline and diesel, it's not enough to encourage those companies to really focus on efficiency. You really need those regulations. And then they're applied you know, industry-wide. So it kind of levels the playing field there. OK, so those are just some, you, know, you guys can go back and read some other interesting historical um, facts if you're, if you're interested. OK, so transportation is a huge piece of our energy, energy system. So about a quarter of our energy goes into our transportation. And we've talked about this before with, with greenhouse gas emissions and the concerns there. It is a very hard to decarbonize sector because we don't have a direct replacement for oil that works in our transportation system. So we're going to talk about other options, but it is hard to decarbonize. It's hard to get rid of some of the air pollution impacts of our transportation system. So looking globally, what are the biggest piece of that transportation system? And it's road transport. So airplanes are a pretty big piece of that. The, the video talked about it being 2% of global greenhouse gas emissions um, because transportation is such a big sector. But really, our energy and our greenhouse gas emissions is dominated by our, our road transport uh, globally and in the US. And a very, very small portion of that is from anything that looks that's renewable. So this is just showing you over a decade of how much of the energy for the transportation system is supplied by non-renewable energy. So most of that's oil. That, um, and then the portion that's provided by renewables, so biofuels or renewable electricity. Very, very small percentage. So just to give a sense, there's a long way to go to try to decarbonize. This, this sector. You've seen this before, but I just wanted to remind you um, that there's huge opportunities here to both improve the efficiency of our transportation system and to diversify the fuels of our transportation system. So we're going to go more into that today. Bringing it down to the US in terms of the, the, the where energy is consumed in our transportation sector, Similar to the global, much of it is on-road transport. So that big yellow wedge, that's our, our light vehicles. Those are passenger vehicles. Those include some of the smaller SUVs and trucks. And then you can see medium and heavy trucks. Some of those might be personal vehicles. Some of those would be more like um, construction vehicles, larger vehicles, um, delivery vans, things like that in, that in that category. But very much dominated by our road transport um, in terms of energy use, and then you'll see later for greenhouse gas emissions. They're very analogous. So most of lecture today, I'm going to focus on personal transport because it's the largest wedge. I will mention some things that are happening for freight and, and other things, but most of what we're going to talk about today will be personal transportation, especially on road. But before I get into just personal transportation, let me give you a few big picture things about freight. So looking at, at freight, um, this is just showing US data. 
Uh, our domestic freight is dominated by road transport, right? That's the most flexible. Those are the big 18 wheelers and trucks that move things around. So that's the, the energy per, uh, per ton that is the, in, our, in our freight transportation. And I wanted to give you a sense of the energy intensity of different modes of moving things around. And so pipelines, that's for our gases like natural gas. Waterways, that's our, our rivers and you know, moving things up the Mississippi and, and over the Great Lakes, things like that. Railroads, trucks, all those are very much more efficient than airplanes. So airplanes are, are pretty much used for the next day delivery. Um, one day delivery, things that need to be moved very quickly. It's a very energy intensive way to move things around. And so one of the things I, I like to, to tell people that you know, if you buy things like from Amazon or something, the reason they're incentivizing you to, to wait four or five days rather than getting the next day is because it's much more costly for them to get it to you quickly. They can try to find the most efficient way to get it to you. And so that is one way of reducing the carbon footprint of your package is just having it take a slower time uh, to get to you because they will optimize because it matters for their bottom line, right? They will optimize and make it the most efficient way to get to you if they have the time to do it. The energy intensity of freight really depends on the size and the tonnage of the different modes. And that's for each kind of mode. So this is a study that actually uh, came out of, of Stanford looking at the energy intensity. You can see that's a log scale over the average load on a log scale for, for metric tons for different modes of, of transport. And all of them, as they get bigger and have more tonnage, you get more efficient. And so you can see some, some studies that look at the efficiency of like oil tankers, for example. It tends to be very efficient because they're huge. They're large, they're full of they're high tonnage. They're going to be a lot more efficient than some of the, the smaller ships or boats, things like that. Okay? And so you see that for each mode for, for freight. All right, let's bring it to personal travel and transportation, and then we'll start to get into some of the impacts of transportation. OK, so this is looking at the energy intensity for passenger transport modes. This is real data. So you can see there's a range of energy intensity for all of these modes. So that's the bars, and the average is the, is the little dot. Um, this is global data. Um, and so you can see rail, uh, two-wheelers, buses. With high ridership, those are going to be the most efficient. Cars, aviation, those are going to be the least efficient. Even with aviation having a pretty high ridership, it's going to be least efficient. Um, these numbers, and I, I put it down here at the bottom, really significantly change with ridership. And so we see in the US, like with buses and rail, where public transit isn't as highly uh, utilized as some other countries, we can see it be pretty inefficient in some places. Um, and so there's certainly opportunity to increase the efficiency of our transportation system by increasing utilization of some of our public transit systems. All right, and then finally, just talking about vehicles overall. This will be no surprise to anyone. The number of vehicles in the world continues to grow and is growing rapidly. Um, you can see there was a rapid growth in, in China, but now it's been pretty steady. But just overall in the world, the uh, number of vehicles on the road are increasing. Um, so this is actual vehicles registered. But you can see the US has more registered vehicles than anywhere else in the world. Um, and I like to point out that it's almost like a, one vehicle per person um, in the US. And so that includes every man, woman, child, baby. We have about one vehicle on the road per person. So very car dominated um, society here versus the world, which you know, that has 0.2 cars per person in the world. All right, so let's talk about the externalities and policies. So there's a lot of different ways we could talk about transportation. Um, I'm going to take you through the externalities and then the solutions for those externalities as a way to talk about our transportation system. So we're going to start just with a summary of externalities. Um, we've talked about national security and trade balance. Safety is one of the, the externalities from our transportation system. Um, so car crashes, both in the US and globally, it's 
their um, significant impact on people. Air pollution, which we'll talk more about. Uh, air pollution tends to be more locally, so communities that live along highways in particular have a lot of impact from the air pollution. And then, of course, greenhouse gas emissions. Land and water pollution, which may not come up in your mind right away, um, but there is leakage from our transportation system, whether that is at gas stations, from vehicles themselves, that gets into the waterways. Uh, one of the things we see in the Bay Area where it doesn't rain until the winter is that first rain often washes a lot of the oils and the leakage and stuff that has leaked all summer into our waterways. So we tend to see an increase after that first rain of water pollution from our, our transportation system right after um, kind of the summer has ended and winter is starting. And so there is a lot of leakage that goes into our local waterway systems just from the vehicles. And then in terms of land use, uh, landfills, things like that, cars are actually pretty highly recycled, um, especially a lot of the steel and things like that. Plastics are much harder to recycle, so it kind of depends on what part of the car you're talking about. Um, but there is a lot of reuse and recycling already built into our or vehicle uh, system. OK, resource use. There's a lot of that, right? We'll talk more about the land use for our infrastructure for transportation. And then, of course, all of the manufacturing and resources that go into building our vehicles, our airplanes, things like that. It is significant. Congestion is a big one. Um, just showing a nice congested road in the picture, right? So congestion is something that impacts human, human uh, quality of life. Um, studies have shown in places where there's a lot of congestion and long commute hours, people tend to have uh, lower health outcomes from that, that time that they spend every day in a, in a vehicle, time that you're, you can't be doing other things. And of course, there's increase in stress and then the, the pollution associated with our congestion. And then on the equity and justice side, um, safety is a big concern, especially in the developing world. Um, our highway planning in the US, um, a lot of it was planned to intentionally divide up communities along racial lines. Um, so similar to redlining, we see that in, you know, historically. Um, and that has dramatically impacted how the transportation system impacts different communities in the US. Um, the low-income communities tend to be the ones next to highways, so they experience higher impacts from it. Um, and then how big of a portion is transportation, which, like we said, was so necessary for your job, for your access to, to food, uh, daycare, things like that. Um, it can be a huge portion of the budget for low-income families. So all of this are externalities that are associated with our transportation system. And we'll go through each one in a little bit more more detail. So let's start in air pollution. So starting with greenhouse gas emissions, um, this is showing global greenhouse gas emissions and US greenhouse gas emissions. Transportation is a huge piece of the wedge for greenhouse gas emissions. 15% uh, in the world, almost 30% in the US in terms of our greenhouse gas emissions and a very, very hard sector to decarbonize. Like we saw with energy consumption, right? This is analogous. Our greenhouse gas emissions and our transportation system are dominated by this personal transport. transport. So passenger cars, light duty trucks, those are, those are personal vehicles. Some of the heavy, medium and heavy duty vehicles are also personal transport. So it's dominating the, the greenhouse gas emissions and also the major contributor to air pollution like ozone. So ozone, uh, you've probably heard of that. It's a main component of smog. It's a combination of sunlight and the emissions coming out of our cars. A lot of people don't know that ozone is also a greenhouse gas. We don't talk about it a lot. We don't see it in our greenhouse gas emissions charts because it's not emitted. It is produced from other things that are being emitted. But it is still a contributor to greenhouse gas or to our, our climate change as a greenhouse gas. It's relatively short-lived, so it's one of those greenhouse gases that if we could reduce air pollution, we could quickly reduce ozone's impact on climate change. Similar to what we see with like black carbon. Black carbon lasts a few weeks to a month. 
If we could stop emitting black carbon, that would have more immediate impacts on reducing um, climate change. So similar to that. OK. So what, the way I kind of want to talk about air pollution and the impacts and, and some of these externalities is something similar to a Kaya identity. So Kaya identity um, was really come up as this way of breaking down the components that are contributing to um, a greenhouse gas emission. We can do that in, in transportation. And it's, it's just a, a way to break it down so you can think about how can we attack different pieces of the puzzle um, individually to overall reduce what you're trying to reduce. And so this is an example of a, something similar to a Kai identity that's just for transportation. So you have your emission, right? So this, we're putting CO2. It could be something else if you're trying to look at that. The, and that CO2 that's emitted is based on the number of vehicles that there are, how many miles those vehicles go, how efficient those vehicles are, and how carbon intensive their fuel is. And when you break it down by this, then you can see that there's solutions for these different pieces that we're going to talk about. So you could have direct regulation. We see that sometimes. In terms of number of vehicles, some places tax vehicles a lot to try to have fewer vehicles. You can also think about just trying to have fewer vehicles on the road. That it also impacts vehicle miles traveled. So telecommuting or public transit, those are going to reduce vehicle miles. So it's another piece of the puzzle. Vehicle efficiency. So you can try to make the vehicles that the, the traditional vehicles, gasoline, diesel vehicles, as efficient as possible. You can also have mode switching to something like an electric vehicle that is, that is more efficient. So you can increase the efficiency of your vehicles. And of course, you can think about how to decrease the carbon intensity of your fuel. Um, so that can be with fuel switching to, to cleaner electricity. That can be sustainable biofuels, hydrogen, other things that are reducing that carbon intensity. And so when you break it down like this, you can try to think about solutions and the policies and the markets that you need to, to encourage these kind of solutions. All of these and a lot of the, the work that I, I did in transportation um, helps with energy security concerns as well. And I bring this up because people are motivated by, by different reasons to try to, to reduce the oil usage in our transportation system. Um, and so energy security can be a big one for, for um, some policymakers and individuals. OK, we're going to talk about air pollution. I've mentioned that I grew up in Houston, where air pollution was very present in, in myself and my health as, as a kid. So air pollution was very much a motivating factor for me to get into engineering and doing an emphasis in air pollution. And then my, my PhD work was actually doing air, air quality monitoring or modeling, um, especially looking at how biofuels will impact human health and air pollution. Uh, so I'll take you through a few kind of fun facts about air pollution and where things are. But um, could, if you have any questions, I really could talk a long time about, about air pollution and the impacts. OK, so let's start with air pollution um, in California. So this picture is a picture just in the afternoon at the Civic Center in Los Angeles in the 1940s. Air pollution was very bad in the 40s and 50s in Los Angeles. So Los Angeles is kind of the, the ideal place to have air pollution um, at extreme levels. Because it is a basin, it is surrounded by mountains. And so that air settles and stays in that basin. It gets a lot of sunlight that's going to create ozone and smog. And it has a lot of people and a lot of cars that are emitting the precursor for a lot of that air pollutant. So they are one of the places that saw uh, a lot of the impacts from the vehicle use in the 40s and 50s and really caused a lot of activism to bring this to regulators that this needed to be cleaned up. Talk to people that lived in LA at this time, and you would rarely see the, the hills and the mountains surrounding um, LA, which we, if you go to LA now, you see those regularly. So, Really dramatic impacts. Uh, people would have to bring handkerchiefs and wipe their eyes a lot. It was difficult to breathe if you went outside from the air pollution. 
So this is just a fun thing. Uh, this is a can of smog uh, that was sold for, you know, like um, tourists that were coming to, to LA um, because it was, it was such a present thing. So you could buy genuine Los Angeles smog as, as a souvenir from visiting Los Angeles. Some people got entrepreneurial about it. Uh, I love this picture. So this person was bringing in fresh, clean desert air that you could breathe out of a balloon and buy it um, to, to have some clean air to breathe. OK, so what happened? Um, like I said, there was a lot of activism. At first, people really didn't want to believe it was their cars that was causing this problem. There was a lot of regulation on home fires and backyard burning and things like that. But there was a researcher at Caltech that really said, OK, automobiles are really the primary contributor. Um, but we can come up with, with solutions. And so California, through the Department of Public Health, had its first tailpipe emission standards in 1966, formed the California Resources Board um, in 1967, and then the, the Federal Air Quality Act came after that. The timeline of this is significant. Because California acted before the federal government did on air pollution, California has had a, a different status in terms of air pollution regulations. So it is the only state that can set stricter air pollution than the federal government requires. Every other state in the US can either follow federal standards or California standards. Um, California only has this status because it started first. And so what we've seen is California has really led the way in reducing uh, air pollution and then driving that change at the federal government level. So California tends to have tighter air quality standards first. The federal government will follow two to three years later. OK, so what does that look like now? We have these standards. It's called Tier 3 or LEV 3. They're, they're pretty similar right now in terms of the latest standards. Um, but you just continue to see this ratcheting down of what, it, what um, the, the tailpipe emissions are allowed from vehicles to impact air pollution. Uh, so there are states that follow California's standards instead of the federal government standards. The reason that um, they don't allow all states to do their own thing is because you actually have to change the vehicles. And so the automakers are like, OK, we, we can meet two standards, but we can't meet 50. Um, and so you actually have different air quality or tailpipe emissions from a truck you might buy in California versus a truck you might buy in Texas, even though if it's the same F-150. So if you go to fueleconomy.gov, you can see the differences um, in terms of the tailpipe emissions, depending on where you buy uh, your vehicle because of these different air quality standards. Okay. So air pollutants have really declined with these air quality standards in the US. Um, but transportation still tends to be a pretty significant contributor. So that top chart is showing you how much of those pollutants are from the transportation system. So pretty significant for our, our NOx um, and our carbon monoxide emissions in the US, very transportation related. Um, one of the, the things that made it easier to pass air quality standards was that we had a solution, and that was the catalytic converter. Um, so originally, it just reduced carbon monoxide and volatile organic compounds. Um, carbon monoxide right, is direct, directly has impact on our, on our health. VOCs contribute to smog, um, so that was significant. Nowadays, our catalytic converter can also reduce NOx emissions, which also contributes to smog. So it was a solution, right? And so that makes it easier to pass regulation is when you have a technological solution. Um, I think now what we see catalytic converters in the news is because people are stealing them, right? Especially off of Priuses, right? You guys all heard that, right? It's like you see it on the news regularly because there's a lot of precious metals in those catalysts that are in our catalytic converters. And so as the precious metal prices go up, it, people started stealing catalytic converters to sell the precious metals um, that are in them. OK, so we mentioned, I mentioned that air pollution along highways tends to be higher. And so those communities have a bigger impact from our transportation system than communities that are further away from our highways. And so I just wanted, this was a study done in California just to illustrate that. 
Um, it was done in the Bay Area, and it's looking at exposure to PM2.5. Remember, this is an air pollutant that has some of the most impact on human health. And PM2.5 is primarily going to be from diesel vehicles. So that's going to be your 18-wheelers, a lot of that, that kind of transportation. And you can see the disproportionate, this is population-weighted PM2.5 exposure by different races. And you can see that, that it is very much disproportionate. Um, so African Americans on the upper end getting more exposure to PM2.5 compared to like um, white or Native American on the other side. Um, and this picture is showing you the, the pockets of why, that, why it's like that. Um, and just something that just came up in the last year or so, um, one of the contributors to some of this inequity and the impacts from our, our transportation system. We have these two highways, 580 and 880, that run parallel. Um, trucks are not allowed to drive on 580. And so this is a long-standing ban um, that those communities were able to put in place so that they had less of the impact from the trucking that we're all benefiting from, right? It's our, it's our freight system. And so disproportionately now all of that impact is on the communities that are along the 880 corridor. So you'll find this when you get, in a, you know, get into a lot of the transportation systems. Um, there is not equity of access to decision making that can really impact some of these, these health impacts. Okay, so what are the, some of the things that the federal government does to try to clean up the air pollution from our transportation system? They do some different things on regulating the fuels themselves um, in order to try to address some of the air pollutants of concern. And so our air pollutants of concern, we worry about NOx and VOCs for smog. We worry about carbon monoxide, so that's about trying to get it going all the way to CO2, which doesn't directly impact our health. CO is poisonous to us. Um, and then other toxic air pollutants, sulfur dioxide, we want those out of our fuels. And so one of the things that the federal government requires in certain areas is what's called reformulated gasoline. So reformulated gasoline is just, is just blended to burn cleaner, to reduce smog and toxic pollutants. And it's in places where the air quality is not meeting the standards that is required. And so about 30% of the gasoline in the US um, that is sold is reformulated to try to address some of those air quality concerns. Oxygenates are added to our fuels. What you're trying to do there by adding an oxygenate, you're adding a molecule that has an oxygen on it to try to encourage it to burn all the way to CO2 rather than stopping at CO. So you're trying to reduce those carbon monoxide emissions. From a lot of vehicles today, Carbon monoxide emissions aren't a huge concern. Uh, older vehicles, um, especially vehicles that are 20 plus years old, it's more of a concern. Most vehicles today have very, very low carbon monoxide uh, emissions. But we add oxygenates in the form of ethanol. And the reason we do that really is because it also meets our, our biofuel standards, which we'll talk more about in the, the biomass lecture. So that is an oxygenate that's being added, less so these days to address carbon monoxide, more to meet our, our biofuel standards um, that are required both federally and in California. OK, there is standards on terms of how much evaporation is allowed. So there's, there's things they can do to the fuel to reduce the volatile organic compounds that are evaporating, and then removing sulfur, which we've already talked about in the oil lecture. Right? We don't want sulfur coming out our, our tailpipe and the impacts of acid rain and things like that. OK, so one of the things that I, I like to talk about in terms of our fuels is octane, because this is something you see when you go to the pump, right? You see these different grades, 87, 89, 91. What does that mean? OK, so the octane is really about the required compression needed for your, your vehicle. So you should always just use whatever um, octane that your vehicle will run on. Um, so ethanol can not only serve as an oxygenate, it also can serve as an octane booster. Um, what you'll see for the higher octane fuels, that typically means that you have a turbo booster or you have usually more like luxury vehicles can sometimes have higher compression engines that require that higher octane. And so there's no energy difference 
and there's no quality difference between those octanes. And so I bring this up because there was a study done showing the, the billions of dollars Americans waste thinking that they're getting a higher quality fuel because they're getting a higher octane fuel for their vehicle, higher octane than it needs. That, all, that just means you're going to have more air pollution coming out your tailpipe because it's not made to burn that, that octane. Okay? We used to use lead as an octane booster. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. Lead has very significant impacts on human health. So that was, um, there was a lot of water contamination and impact on humans as we used lead as an octane booster. We now use ethanol uh, primarily as our, our octane booster. So lead, a huge environmental legacy issue from being used as an octane booster around the world. Uh, it is pretty much um, banned around the world. There are a few countries We've had students that are from other countries in Africa that say they still, there is still leaded fuel in some other places that aren't on this map. But in the 80s, uh, it was outlawed uh, in the US and solely around the world. Um, use of lead for gasoline as an octane booster has ended. So you'll see unleaded gasoline, right? Well, we're not taking lead out of the gasoline. We're just no longer adding it. That's what we're talking about when we're talking unleaded gasoline. But it persists in the environment and waterways, and it is still used in avgas. So avgas is what's used in small airplanes. Um, so a lot of small airplanes that you see at the Palo Alto Airport or San Carlos Airport, they use avgas. And avgas has leaded fuel. These are a lot of small airplanes. Personal planes are um, old and still run on these leaded fuels. And so there was a study just done recently from the EPA. It was uh, released in 2019, um, many years late from when they were supposed to release this study. But you can see that they are doing the, you know, looking at the lead emissions from these different airports. You can see San Carlos down there, third from the bottom, uh, pretty high lead rates coming from our small airplanes, which are right around communities, waterways, things like that. So there is hope for, on this end. Um, so this is a San Jose, East San Jose Airport, which is a small airport, that there are other solutions that are coming on that are finally getting to the point where they can compete um, economically that are non-leaded options for our small airplanes. So this should help reduce new emissions of lead in these areas from, from our small aviation. I also wanted to give you a sense that even a small change in some of our transportation systems can have a significant impact on the local air quality. So this is a study that was done in my hometown of Houston, looking at, OK, if we electrify just a portion of the vehicles, what, what impact would that have on, on air quality and air pollution? Um, and so this is showing you both for medium and heavy duty vehicles and light duty vehicles, um, and you can see just electrifying 1% um, of the vehicles leads to a 25% reduction in NOx for the heavy, heavy duty and medium duty vehicles. It takes a lot more of our light duty vehicles because the air pollution tends to be less out of our passenger vehicles to get that 20, same 25% reduction in NOx. Um, so just to say that it can take, a, you know, just cleaning up a small portion of it can have in, you know, huge impacts. This was looking at NOx. If we wanted to talk about particulate matter coming from our, our diesel vehicles, again, changing a small portion of them can really have significant impacts on the air pollution. OK, let's talk about vehicle efficiency. Um, so this is showing some of the early versions of electric vehicles and what they look like. Very different today. Um, if, you're interested and you enjoy watching The Simpsons like I do, I recommend trying to find this little electric car of the future. This was, uh, they were visiting something that's meant to be like, like Epcot, where they were going and doing the different rides. And this was Electric Car of the Future, sponsored by the oil industry. So it's, pretty, it's a pretty funny video clip if you guys want to go check that out. OK, so let's talk about vehicle efficiency. All right. We've talked about this before, that the, the motive efficiency of our vehicles is really low. And so this is a picture from, from a book called Resource Revolution. 
that was just illustrating that less than 1% of the car's fuel actually moves our driver around. And, and only you know, about 10% is actually moving the car around. There's a lot of engine losses, there's a lot of idling losses, rolling resistance, things like that. Um, so it, it's just a very inefficient heat engine to move us around um, in our vehicles. And so ways that we can encourage people to buy more efficient vehicles, one of them would be a higher fuel price. So some countries like Europe is, is pretty well known for having pretty high taxes on their fuels, which encourages people to purchase and drive more efficient vehicles uh, because of the, the high fuel prices. What I'm showing you here in this chart, the green, that, that's kind of the cost of the fuel, very much similar around the world because it depends more on the price of crude oil than, than local or regional differences. Much of the difference in what people actually pay has to do with taxes added to the fuel. And so you can see a lot of the top countries up there. There's a lot of European countries that add a lot of taxes to their fuels. US is down here at the bottom with very, very low um, taxes on, on our fuels. Uh, the federal tax hasn't changed since the mid-90s. We do have regional and, and state taxes, of course. Um, that can vary a lot. But one of the challenges of gasoline tax is it's regressive, meaning that high gasoline prices have bigger impact on low-income households where their transportation is a bigger portion of their budget than it does on high-income households. And so there is challenges there um, in terms of how do you equitably encourage fuel economy with uh, using something like a gas tax. Right. You can also think of a gas tax as similar to a carbon tax. So some of the same challenges um, when we're thinking about that. So we do regulate um, efficiency on our vehicles in the US. I mentioned the CAFE standard, corporate average fuel economy. What does that mean? It means that we don't have a standard efficiency. What we do is the average of all the vehicles that a, a company sells has to meet a certain fuel economy standard based on the mix of vehicles they sell. Because we have different requirements for small passenger vehicles than we do for large trucks. They are based on the footprint of the vehicle, so like the wheelbase, um, and the type of vehicle they are. And so the average of what that, that manufacturer sells gives them their fuel economy standard that they have to meet for their, their entire fleet. And so you'll see that it varies very much. You can see these are the, the requirements for different manufacturers. Um, this is in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, so grams per mile. They do kind of a conversion between the fuel economy and the CO2 emissions. But you can see the standard is, is very different uh, for different manufacturers. Some of them are meeting them. Some are not meeting them. Tesla is, is negative, right, as an all-electric vehicle manufacturer. This standard that has been in place for a long time is a cap and trade standard. These companies can trade their credits between each other. They can use credits in the future, they can use credits in the past, they have like variability and then they have to you know, hand in those credits to meet their standards if they're, if they're not meeting them. Right? So it has long been a cap and trade system. It wasn't operating, really functioning as cap and trade until Tesla came on the scene and was like, we don't need our credits, we're gonna sell them, right? And so now there is some trading among auto manufacturers that didn't exist previously. The CAFE standard, and you can see how the impact it had on real world fuel economy, when it was put in place, dramatically increase in fuel economy. At the time, there was a lot of concern from the auto industry, oh, we're only gonna be able to make small cars, we're never gonna be able to meet these standards, people aren't gonna want fuel efficient vehicles, right? They were able to maintain size and horsepower of their vehicles and still improve fuel economy of the vehicles at, this, at the same time. And so there was this dramatic increase in fuel economy. And then you see, not only does it stagnate, it actually declines for a while. So the fuel economy standards didn't move, but people started buying more SUVs and trucks than passenger cars. And so we got this decline in real world fuel economy. And it wasn't really until the Obama administration that we really started ramping up 
our fuel economy standards again, and you can see we're seeing the results of that, where we're seeing real world fuel economy improve again from our efficiency standards. So what does the buying and selling look like? Um, we have no idea what these are bought and sold for, how much they cost. It is not a transparent market. Companies don't have to tell us who they're selling it to or how much it is. They just have to report how many they have. And so you can see these are companies that sold. These are companies that purchase. You can kind of guess, well, it looks like maybe Tesla is selling to Stellaris, right? Um, but they don't have to disclose that. So we just see the, the results of the buying and selling of of those credits. And this is showing this the CO2 emissions by new vehicle sales um, as they are declining with, with the standard. Um, and of course, now we're down with that, that zero mark. Those are electric vehicles that are on the road. As I said, it didn't impact horsepower or size or weight of cars. So that chart on the right I'm showing you is showing you that, again, that real world fuel economy, what horsepower looks like and what weight looks like. And so we've been able to increase, continue to increase horsepower while improving fuel economy and maintain the size and weight of our vehicles with those efficiency standards. And you can see how um, buying habits really changed and how that impacted the, the fuel economy of the overall fleet um, as more trucks, trucks and SUVs uh, became more popular with consumers. OK, so what are some of the things that we can do to improve the efficiency of our vehicles? One of the things we can do is lightweight our vehicle. So those of you who have, we've talked about Amory Levins, um, really looking at energy efficiency. One of the things he really looked at was how do we lightweight vehicles, looking at carbon fiber as an option to maintain safety, but really uh, decrease the weight of our vehicles. And so the BMW i3 had a carbon fiber chassis, and you can see they can just lift it up. Um, so that's one way of improving the efficiency, right? If we have lighter vehicles, they're easier to move around. The automakers, of course, have always worried about safety of lighter vehicles, which is why you kind of have to use these advanced materials like carbon fiber, um, which it is harder to make cost effective. So it's straightforward, but challenging um, economically. Um, for some of the lightweighting solutions. Other thing you can do is electrify either all of or portions of the vehicle. So just electrification, adding that to your vehicle dramatically increases the efficiency of the vehicle. So there's different ways and there's different levels of electrification. There is the complete electrification um, shown here, which is just you know, batteries with your motor. You have regenerative braking, right? Regenerative braking is the the innovation where you're using the motor to slow down your vehicle, so you're actually creating electricity and storing that in your battery. So that is a way of electrifying a portion of your vehicle to improve the efficiency of your vehicle. So this is pretty a simple solution because you only have the one system. You don't have a lot of mechanical moving parts, so it tends to be a lower maintenance. You don't have oil changes and all those kind of things um, with the, the pure electric vehicle. Hybrid electric vehicles, which we've seen a lot for a long time, right? Our Priuses, I have a, a Toyota Highlander, a hybrid electric vehicle. You have both systems. You have both kind of the electric system and the gasoline system. But you can have a smaller gasoline system, and it can operate at its optimum rate. So all of these gasoline engines have an optimum that they'd like to operate at. And if you have a hybrid, you can use the battery and the electric motor to keep that engine operating at its most efficient mode. Um, so this also has regenerative braking, um, operates similarly to a gasoline car, right? So you don't have uh, any sort of behavior change needed for this type of electrification. The next stage is just kind of like that, um, boosted with electric electrification, where you have a plug-in hybrid. Um, so this is like the Chevy uh, Volt has, has both systems. Um, so you, you have a larger battery. You can run some on just electric, and then you also still have your gasoline system. And then fuel cell vehicles are also a way of electrifying uh, your system. So a fuel cell vehicle is basically an electric car. You just have onboard production of electricity using hydrogen and a fuel cell. 
Uh, so it's a little bit more complicated than the, the battery system where you're making your electricity somewhere else and just loading it up in your car. Here with a fuel cell vehicle, you are making electricity on board, but you're still reducing air pollution. You only have water coming out your tailpipe. Um, and it's basically operating like an electric vehicle uh, powered by hydrogen. OK, so I, I tried to put a summary of some of the, the good and bad about electric vehicles. Um, I think we've talked about some of the challenges already in this class. We've talked about energy storage and things like that. Um, but there's, there's a lot of benefits, not just the efficiency, the diversification of fuels, the ability to decarbonize um, the fuel system at the same time as you're electrifying our transportation system. So I'm not going to go through all of these. You can look at them, at them later. Um, but I did want to give you a sense that in terms of challenges and barriers to electrification of transportation and adoption of electric vehicles, there was a study done by the IEA, a lot of it having to do with range anxiety, so that has to do with our charging infrastructure, um, having the options for other types of electric vehicles, which are coming more online, capital cost, uh, that can be significant. So we see more electric vehicles in countries that have policies that's, that reduce the capital costs of our electric vehicles, um, behavioral changes, the uncertain policy support for electric vehicles. OK, so in terms of efficiency, this, was, this is a, a study done out of MIT looking at just a pure battery electric vehicle, a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle, and a conventional vehicle. So you can give a sense of the dramatic increase in efficiency that we see when we're using a battery and an electric motor to, to move us around. I often get the question of, well, what if the electric vehicle is powered by coal? Um, is it really better? So I, I encourage you to check out this, this site. This is from the Department of Energy, um, which shows the different greenhouse gas emissions for all electric, plug-in hybrid, hybrid, and gasoline in different, all the different states in, in the US. So here I'm showing the national averages in California. All electric is way better in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. Not really fair comparison. So I did want to bring up, here's West Virginia, very coal-dominated state. You can see that all electric vehicle, not necessarily better than the hybrid today, right? because of that, that coal-fired power plant, but still better than the comparable gasoline vehicle. And so, as I said, the, this, the magic of electrification is the diversification of fuels, and you can clean up your fuels at the same time. You don't have to change your vehicle as you clean up the fuels that are, that are uh, powering it. Real concerns about range anxiety. Um, a lot of advocates for electric vehicles will say, well, it meets the average needs of, of people. Well, people don't buy their cars to meet average needs. They buy a car is a pretty big capital expenditure for most households. It needs to meet all of their needs, not just their average needs. And so the range and the increase in range with battery electric vehicles has uh, been a significant driver in the increase in sales of electric vehicles. Um, so Working on the charging infrastructure and the range of the electric vehicles are both key for adoption of electric vehicles. Talking about the, the charging network, so there's different levels of charging. Level one is like plugging into the wall, very slow. Level two is like using the 240 volt system in your house. That's usually what's used to run your electric dryer or some of your appliances. That's much faster, so a lot of home charging is done on that 240 volt. If you live in an individual um, family home, then there's DC fast charging that's much char faster. There's Tesla superchargers. Uh, the latest one is, is um, I think they're even getting up to 350 kilowatts. Um, very fast charging. So, having experienced a lot of these, uh, I when I lived in an apartment, I would literally run an extension cord out my window to my car to charge it. And it, was, it would charge three miles an hour. OK, so that was fine for me because I was taking the train to work every day. And so I could take several days to fill up my car. But that is not going to work for, for most households. And so that is a major problem when we're talking about multifamily housing. 
Um, in my neighborhood, a lot of the, the families that I know are in multifamily housing use the charging network that's at the grocery store. And so they have to pay for that charging separately than their home uh, in order to fill up their cars in a reasonable amount of time, like when they go to the grocery store. I also use the Tesla supercharger network, like when I'm driving to Los Angeles. This literally, it's like, it's like 15 or 20 minutes stop. I stop twice to charge for 20 minutes each time on the way to Los Angeles. And so with a charging network, you can, that's, that at least allows that 80% fill pretty fast, you can have those, those long range uh, trips in your electric vehicle. Public charging systems are growing. Uh, China is doing a lot in this. We are also doing that in the US. Electrify America is a nonprofit that was set up by Volkswagen after Dieselgate, if anybody remembers that. That's where Volkswagen was, was cheating on their emissions and got in a lot of trouble. So one of the things they had to do in response to that, that uh, scandal was to set up this nonprofit and install charging networks across the country. So it's just one of the efforts that is really expanding public charging networks. Tesla still very much dominates the public charging network that is uh, in place today. And we're seeing more and more vehicles that are making deals to be able to use Tesla superchargers rather than other, or in addition to other charging networks. So this is something what the EV charging network looks like in the US and it's increasing all the time. Okay, cost of fueling up on electricity versus fuel is one of the benefits of uh, electric vehicles. So this is just um, from the EIA showing how much cheaper it is to fuel up on electricity. Electricity tends to be a pretty low cost um, fuel for our systems. Okay. So our infrastructure bill is really investing in domestic battery supply chain to address some of that. We're seeing global sales of electric vehicles increase. So this is just showing it by country. Um, this is showing it from the EIA and percent of global sales, somewhere around 10% in 2022 of global sales. That is a long way from having a real change in the, the whole um, on-road system to electrification but it is growing very rapidly in terms of electric vehicle sales. And we're seeing more and more companies really um, committing to electric vehicles. Um, and of course, we're seeing some of the impacts of that here in the US with automaker, the auto unions worried about jobs um, with changes in the, the types of vehicles that the automakers are going to be making. Tesla still very much dominates electric vehicle sales. Um, BYD is a, is a Chinese company that, that sells a lot of electric vehicles. And if you see the Marguerite on campus, those vehicles are BYD. The electric vehicles are, are made by BYD. Um, so those are growing groups of electric vehicles, um, selling electric vehicles. It may surprise some of you that Norway is a place that leads um, the sales of electric vehicles in terms of percentage of overall car sales, this is all very much policy based. This is the reason Norway leads that. So in Norway, there are significant taxes to importing vehicles um, and they waive those for electric vehicles. So they're basically making the electric vehicle cheaper than its, its gasoline counterpart, which is why we see a lot of electric vehicle sales. There's a lot of policies encouraging and supporting electric vehicles. I've just listed a few of them here um, because this is a way to decarbonize our system. If we didn't worry about greenhouse gas emissions, these policies wouldn't exist. That's, that's why they're there. And this just gives you a sense of globally where other places would have some of these policies. Automakers are, are joining on that, not just for personal vehicles, um, but looking at, at long haul trucking, uh, aviation, buses, um, like, like we have with Marguerite, is growing, but still a very small percentage of overall sales for both trucking and buses. So a lot of growth to happen here. One of the places that I think is super exciting is the electrification of school buses. School buses have shown that have pretty high air pollution. 
And so pretty high impact on kids riding school buses. And so one of the policies in the Inflation Reduction Act supports electrification of school buses. And so we're seeing a dramatic increase in purchase of electric school buses for um, school systems around the country. What we're going to do with airplanes and, and boats and shipping, I think, is still in question. Uh, they're harder to electrify uh, because of their, their modes of operation. But we will see some of that. We'll see some, especially short haul electrification of, of airplanes. We're already seeing some very expensive, fancy boats that are electrified. Um, but I would say these are hard to decarbonize areas that so we'll see other solutions as well. So investment's growing, electrification is growing. Um, that's what's happening on electrification. I want to talk for the last few minutes about vehicle miles traveled and then maybe embodied energy. So vehicle miles traveled, a way to, uh, to address that is telecommuting, things like that, having walkable cities, um, and also public transit, um, like my favorite is, is taking the train. It's very different depending on where you are if you have access to some of these public transit options. Uh, so what this chart is showing you is transportation-related energy consumption um, per urban density. And you can see my hometown of Houston way up there at the top. Um, very, very spread out. Not a lot of options other than personal vehicles. Hong Kong very much on the other end of the spectrum. right? So there's different options. Here in the America, we depend very much on our cars for our commutes and our trips. And we tend to have a lot of cars per household. Um, and that's in all sorts of different metropolitan areas, including, including the Bay Area. What we do at Stanford is we have a lot of policies to try to um, reduce the no amount of drive alone, to encourage public transit. A lot of those policies work fairly well, but you can see there's still a pretty significant portion of drive alone. So public transit, pretty underutilized in the US. It's uh, it dropped dramatically during the pandemic. It is starting to come back. Um, faces a lot of challenges in terms of public support for public transit. You have to make the, the system work for the people that are using it. Right? It has to be just as good as um, driving alone, because often they have that option. First and last mile solutions, these are just some of them. So a lot of the challenges of public transit is getting you from the hub to where you're actually going. Um, in my family, my husband's favorite uh, is the one wheel. So he takes the one wheel to the train and then takes the train up to South City and then takes the one wheel to, to his office. Um, so he has a lot of fun doing that, but he's also broken several bones doing that. So there are safety concerns with some of these um, first and last mile solutions, but he'll never give up his one wheel. Um, but this is one of the challenges right, with public transit. I mentioned this already, so I, I won't go too much into it. But we, we, do, we didn't plan our highways um, to really think about equitable transportation. Um, some of them were very intentionally put to divide up communities. And so that has led to challenges for equitable transportation. The final thing I'll say on this is in the Bay Area, it is just recently that we've actually done land planning and transportation planning in the same plan and working together. And that's called Plan Bay Area. And because of this, one of the key outcomes was transit-oriented housing. Before that, land planning was done separately from transportation planning. If you really want to have livable communities, walkable communities, and you really want to have equitable transportation, these kind of planning decisions have to be done together. Another thing to think about when we're talking about our transportation systems is the embodied energy. And this is something I actually get asked about a lot um, when we're talking about advanced vehicles. But embodied energy, you want to think about how much energy resources um, that we put into our transportation system. And that can be very different depending on the type of transportation we're looking at. So here I'm showing some roadways, um, a lot of energy and resource and land use goes into our transportation system in the form of roadways, airports, um, train systems, things like that, that are gonna have different intensity of embodied energy per person or freight that's being moved around. So you can imagine train systems are much more land and resource 
um, use efficient than our trucking or our individual car vehicle plus uh, roadway type systems, but those roadways can be more flexible. So embodied energy is just one aspect to think about in terms of our transportation system. So I get asked a lot about the embodied energy of a vehicle in terms of the uh, the benefit from going from a traditional gasoline or diesel vehicle to an electric vehicle, for example. And so the question is, you know, there's a lot of resources that go into creating that vehicle. A lot of, you know, capital goes into it. A lot of uh, carbon dioxide emissions happen when you're creating the vehicle. How does that compare to the life the lifetime use of that vehicle and the carbon dioxide emit emitted? And for all of this, um, the big answer is it depends. Research shows a, a lot of variance between the life cycle carbon dioxide emissions of a vehicle, what portion of that is the embodied energy of the vehicle? In other words, should you keep operating your old, less efficient car or get, get a new car? A lot of times, and we've seen this with a lot of appliances as well, uh, because most of the energy and carbon emissions happen during the use of that vehicle or that appliance, it is better to get something that's more advanced um, and and more efficient, but it it does depend, and it's uh, uh, it depends on a lot of a lot of factors in terms of how old it is, what are the the carbon emissions associated with it. So I put some of the uh, the variance of estimates in terms of what portion of the life cycle CO two emissions might be embodied energy. You know that upfront creation of the the car, um, anywhere from five to thirty percent of the life cycle CO two emissions. For an advanced vehicle or an electric vehicle, um, the embodied CO2 emissions are much higher. Uh, and that's because you have such low CO2 emissions over the rest of the life of the vehicle. And so you can imagine if you lowered the life of the vehicle CO2 emissions, then the bigger portion of its overall CO2 emissions will be at that front part. That doesn't mean it necessarily has higher CO2 uh, embodied energy associated with creating the vehicle versus other vehicles. But a lot of times the data is reported in terms of what portion of your life cycle CO2 emissions are embodied energy. And so a lot of things are going to uh, impact your life cycle CO2 emissions, the embodied energy, thinking about can we recycle some of the components of our vehicles. A lot of the steel already is recycled in vehicles. I'll show you that in a minute. When we start talking about electric vehicles, recycling of batteries is going to be a big part of this. Um, so we're not using raw resources and raw materials. We're recycling those back into new vehicles. So a lot of variants here. We do recycle a lot of our vehicles and we have for a long time, much of the metal in vehicles have been, have been recycled for a long time. So here, you know, 84% by weight is, is recycled. Plastic components are much harder to recycle. So those tend to go to landfill rather than being recycled. Our cars last a long time. And this becomes important when we start thinking about how do we decarbonize the transportation system? The cars people are buying today are still going to be in service 20 years from now. And so when we have these goals of 2035, 2045 being net zero or, uh, you know, um, even carbon negative, you have to think about that. That means the, the vehicles that we're selling today impact those goals in 2035, 2045, 2050. Uh, because our vehicles do last a long time. So this does make the transition in the transportation system challenging because of the slow turnover of the vehicles on our road. Embodied use, like I said, it's not just the cars, it's the whole system that supports our use of cars. And so in the United States, much of our transportation system is dependent on roadways and, and cars, trucks, uh, and a lot of those roadways are kept up by taxes, the state, local, and federal level. So very much a public um, public service that is provided to support the use of vehicles um, in our country. 
uh, it is it is really a, a system that is supported by the the government and and our taxes. So this is just giving you a sense of the latest numbers I have. How many roads do we have in the United States? Um, last estimates I have is over four million miles of roads. Um, comparing to China, which is growing in its transportation system, but has half the number of uh, miles of roads as the United States. So again, as we've talked about earlier, United States is a very car uh, dependent um, society and economy for our, for our transportation system. All right, so I mentioned this a, a little bit in a, in a different lecture, if you've checked out the energy transition lecture. Um, Vehicles today have a pretty low capacity factor. And what does that mean? That means that we don't use them for their intended purpose very much. And so if we're thinking about how much embodied energy goes into it, how much capital cost goes into purchasing your car, and then only 4% of the time is it moving around, the other 96% of the time it's parked, it's not a very efficient use of, of that embodied energy and those resources that went in to make that car. And so what are ways that we could use our cars more efficiently? We're seeing those kind of things already. Those are our ride shares. Um, so Ubers and Lyfts or our car shares like Zipcar, where you can you know, rent or loan cars. If you think about that, that is a way to more efficiently use the capital and, and resource intensive work, um, energy that went into making that vehicle because we're having a high, higher utilization of that vehicle. And so we expect at least for a portion of the vehicles in use that we will see a higher utilization with some of these more, um, these new ways of moving around like our, our transportation network uh, service type companies. The other part of low utilization of our transportation system is the roadways themselves. Um, here's, this is another quote from uh, Stefan Heck's Resource Revolution book, that our roadways peak use, reach peak throughput only about 5% of the time, and then they're only 10% covered with cars. So it might seem like they're reaching peak when they're, they're covered in traffic but much of the roadways are not do not have a high utilization. What are ways that we could use that more efficiently? That's when you're starting to talk about automation because in theory, automation would allow cars to drive safely closer together at higher speeds. And then we could have peak throughput more easily and more often than we can with, with human drivers. So those are potentials. I would say automation is still very much in its infant stages. We are not anywhere near having um, reliable widespread automation options in our vehicles, but a lot of advances are, are being made. So talking about our shared use mobility, this is really changing an aspect of transportation. But the question remains on whether this is something that is beneficial from an energy and climate standpoint or something that it hurts and it just increases energy demand um, and impacts on climate. And so there's a lot of factors that will help decide what which way that goes. And so when we're thinking about our Ubers and Lyfts, some of the great things I mentioned, you know, increased utilization of vehicles, potential to reduce car ownership. Um, in some urban areas, it may not be worth it to even own a car if you can get around with these very easy to use um, transportation service uh, systems. Um, it can support public transit, both in providing a way to get from a public transit center, like a, like a train station to your final destination, and also um, as a reliability standpoint. So some people hesitate to use public transit because what if I need to go pick up my, my kids from school or what if there's an emergency and I don't have a vehicle? These can provide that emergency, I need to get from here to there quickly kind of backup system when you are using public transit. So there are these potential benefits of these systems, but then there are also these questions um, that we see in research that there could be increased demand for transportation, um, especially individual car transportation with the ease of these systems. So what does that look like? It could replace public transit um, because it's faster for people that can afford these kind of systems. And so you are reducing the ridership of public transit, which makes public transit less efficient and also can decrease the interest and 
in maintaining our public transit systems. Um, you can also see an increase in congestion um, and induced demand is, is really about like, would I have taken that trip anyway or am I taking a trip because it's so easy now that before I would have waited or I would have consolidated my trips if I had to drive there. Um, but now I am I have more trips um, that I wouldn't have taken before because I have these easy systems. And so I would say this impact on energy demand and and climate change is is still in question. Um, but it is here and it's happening. And so, what really needs to happen now is to continue to investigate these systems and figure out how to have the right kind of incentives to make sure these systems are beneficial overall for society as well as for individuals. Um, and so I think those kind of conversations are still ongoing. Okay, so that's our transportation system in a nutshell in a very quick way. Obviously you could go much more in depth into all of these different topics, but let's look forward and talk about the future of, of transportation. Um, you can see this is just a fun little chart showing the share of transport in total final consumption. So it gives you a sense of how much transportation is happening in different countries. How much do people and goods move around? Um, and we've talked a lot about the U.S. as one of those very transportation heavy countries. But what a big question, I think, is what is going to power our transportation systems in the future? I would say we've pretty much seen that electric vehicles are winning the race for personal vehicles. So for small personal vehicles, for, you know, station wagons, SUVs, trucks, um, these kind of things. Electric vehicles, I think, are so far ahead and offer the most benefits that they are likely to be the clean energy option of the future for personal vehicles. When we start to get to big trucks, airplanes, uh, boats, a lot is still in question. Um, and so I, I kind of put up some options here so we can talk about what is the potential of these things. So when we're talking about semi-trucks. Um, so larger freight moving vehicles. I think there's a very close race between electric and hydrogen as uh, long haul trucking. And so we have to kind of wait and see what's going to happen and what's going to win out. There's pluses and minuses to both of those options. We are seeing this, the electrification of buses is really winning out over hydrogen right now. And so that could lead to the same outcome with the semi trucks, but the distances they travel are very different. So uh, I would say that remains to be seen in terms of clean energy options for the future. Boats, there's a lot going on with boats, um, whether you're talking about big ships or more personal via more personal size, you know, um, smaller boats um, for skiing or water skiing or things like that. So we're seeing electric water skiing boats. Um, but in terms of long haul ships, uh, electrification doesn't have the energy density to yet make long haul shipping um, really work for, for electric vehicles. So uh, for electric boat ships. So we'll, we'll see what happens there. Um, I, I think it's still in question. A lot of the work that is being done right now, I think for greening up shipping is looking for low carbon or no carbon liquid fuels um, to replace the, the petroleum based liquid fuels, oil based liquid fuels that they use now. We're also seeing some great innovative things of thinking about we used to do shipping, which was with wind. And so there are new um, foldable sails and things like that that can go on ships and really improve the efficiency of those ships so they don't have to use as much energy or power to, to do the shipping when the winds are beneficial. So you, then those, those are, are kind of um, systems that really assist in reducing the carbon intensity of that shipping. And so that's one area that I think is really exciting to think about using the wind in the, in the shipping to reduce those, the energy use there. Airplanes are another one that's a big question. Um, there, we are making advances in all electric aircraft, um, we're getting so that we can have further range in larger airplanes, but we're gonna have to see uh, advancement in batteries for those to really be a significant portion of our long haul um, airplanes. We're just not there yet with energy density of, 
of the, the batteries. Um, there are ways to make our airplanes more efficient, lightweighting some of the, the components of the inside of the airplanes, for example, you know, the, the carts that, that we provide food services, things like that in our airplanes. So there's a lot of energy efficiency opportunities there. Um, but the fuel is, I would say, again, still in question. So I've, I've got here an electric one, hydrogen one, sustainable aviation fuel is something that's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, I think we need to be very intentional about how we uh, how we certify the carbon intensity of these fuels, especially when we're talking about biofuels, because we've seen the the challenges with using biofuels in our road transportation and using some fuels that when once you take in land use change and all of the different aspects of creating that biofuel, you're actually having something that's more carbon intensive than the petroleum it replaced. And so with sustainable aviation fuel, I think we also need to, to have a lot of scrutiny on how are we actually um, giving credit to the carbon intensity of those fuels. So something else to be aware of and watch out for um, when you're looking at sustainable aviation fuel and what is happening in that space, really really dig deep into the details on how those, those fuels are being made. Some of the fuels that are more advanced fuels that people are looking at are things like ammonia. So having green hydrogen and, and making ammonia as a fuel or e-methanol, you'll hear a lot about e-methanol. Um, again, you really need to look at what are the sources that are being used to make those fuels and whether they really are a carbon benefit. A lot of, we're gonna see, continue to see a lot of electric vehicle growth. This is just one projection. We're gonna see this in personal vehicles and buses and, and really large trucking as well, uh, alongside maybe other clean energy options. So expect to continue to see that growth um, in electric, electrification of vehicles. Uh, especially with the cost coming down for electric vehicles and with such a low cost of ownership. It's not only the fuel, the electricity that tends to be very inexpensive, but the upkeep and maintenance of an electric vehicle because it's so much simpler uh, tends to be very low. And so we're going to continue to see uh, growth in those, those things. It only takes a little bit of a change to really drive uh, big changes in oil and oil prices and oil demand. Um, and so expect to see that, that just even a little bit of increase in electric vehicles to really impact um, the oil markets. We need more uh, charging networks and more reliable charging networks. There's been a lot of emphasis on this here in the US with some of our more recent policies, um, but this is something that's going to have to expand worldwide. Um, depending on homes and workplaces and public charging, all of those will, will need to have options for electric vehicle charging. Um, so, Again, we'll see more and more growth. We are seeing more and more consolidation around the um, charging types um, in terms of these connectors. And so that will also help if there's a standardization around one type. Again, it's hard to know what's gonna happen in our airplane. So looking forward, um, this is an estimate from the EIA. A major challenge is the growth in demand may offset the declines in gasoline and diesel. So if we see this increased demand in jet fuel um, and we don't have sustainable alternatives, we could, we could um, be continuing to increase our CO2 emissions from transportation um, despite the advances we're making in, in road, road vehicles. So this is something that, that we really need to have advancements in all parts of our transportation system. Automation's not there yet. So automation's really exciting. Um, I'm, I live in the Bay Area near San Francisco, obviously. And so Waymo is, is a prominent um, figure here and, in terms of an automated vehicle that is on the roads um, uh, and, and already self-driving. Um, but we've also had crews here that's had a lot more challenges with their automation system. So this is something that's coming, but it's very early stages. And I think the liability is still very much a question. Uh, so that is, that is a challenge. So we have lots of challenges in our transportation system, lots of opportunities. We will, um, 
we need to be intentional about how we are decarbonizing the system because it is not an easy an easy challenge to tackle. There's a lot of ways that policy can really help. So I just listed a few here that we've done in the in the U.S., um, but there are a lot of different ways that policy is really an important part of greening our transportation system. So just a summary of where we are going with our transportation sitting system. Um, I'll let I'll let you read through this or check this out on your own, but we will continue to have to um, try to look forward and, and how we are going to decarbonize and still move people around and goods around as we need to. So thank you so much for your attention and about transportation. Um, and I hope you'll check out our other resources on our, our website.